So, hey, folks, you're, you're very welcome to our Engage People Elevate series. Uh, obviously, this time around, we're focusing very much on all things grad, uh, graduate recruitment uh, related. Uh, nobody better than Sinead Darcy, who's the head of the Jameson International Graduate Program at Irish Distillers. Uh, I've had the pleasure of, uh, of well, I've no known Sinead by reputation over uh, the last number of years through um, being involved with the Grad Ireland Awards, basically, and J Jemison have always uh, been very successful on that front. So we're going to chat maybe a little bit about um, Sinead's role on a day-to-day -day basis, what that involves, and then re really just sort of dig in a little bit to the grad recruitment market at the moment and then and then what what uh, what lies ahead in the future. Um, so maybe, Sinead, I might ask if it's okay with you, maybe a snapshot if that's okay. You, you can start Start with your most recent uh, role, or maybe start to start from when you first uh, when, when you graduated yourself. In terms of your own experience, we'd love to hear. Yeah, so great to be with you, Paul. I'm um, looking forward to chatting about all things grad, as you said. And um, so for myself, I suppose look, most careers have a lot of twists and turns, and mine uh, definitely has had. And um, I started off as a primary school teacher, and now I work in the whiskey business. So you can probably see that it has been quite a um, a varied journey from getting to, from teaching to actually working uh, with Irish distillers in my current role as head of the Jemison International Graduate Program. So I was lucky enough that you know from a very young age I always knew what I wanted to be. I always wanted to be a teacher because I always had an interest in people and helping people to be the best that they could be. But I didn't really understand that you could do that in roles outside of teaching. Um, so I became a teacher um, and taught for four years um, and then didn't see a long term career for myself in teaching because I suppose you, you look at becoming a principal or an inspector, etc. I didn't really see that as something that I wanted to aspire to long term. So I went off, bitten by the travel book to Australia, as most people do, to, to, to find themselves. And the great thing for me um, for with, with that trip, uh, that one year away in Australia, was that I got to work in other sectors. I got to actually experience the world um, outside of a classroom because I actually had probably been in a classroom for most of my life as either a student or a teacher. So it was really wonderful to actually work in different sectors like banking and hospitality and um, to really see what was out there. So that inspired me to come back to Ireland and do a master's in business. So um, I guess to get that qualification that showed employers I was serious about making a career move from you know education the public sector into the private sector and I suppose since moving um, into the private sector and um, it's been a, a great journey great learning experience I've worked in sectors like uh, telecoms so telco and um, I've worked in banking um, and now I work in FMCG fast moving consumer goods with Irish distillers so it's really been uh, quite the journey it's been really exciting and it's been great to work in the public sector I worked as a primary school teacher I also worked as a lecturer um, in the public sector and now um, as I mentioned working in the, the the private sector so what do I do today well today I uh, look after um, the international graduate program for Jemison. It's basically an advocacy program or for students uh, looking to build their career in marketing. It's a very solid foundation in that. So I look after the 360 strategic direction of the program in terms of how we attract uh, graduates how we recruit and select them, how we then train them, onboarding them, but also offboarding has become a big trend um, in our space in the last five years. So we have a pretty robust offboarding program as well. So I guess that's maybe a long answer to a short question for you, Paul. Thanks very much. And if we go back actually to, because a very interesting point you, you, you mentioned there that you you had a passion to become a teacher um, and obviously that was the path you pursued and and then you obviously, you know, the, the term they use now is pivoted over into a different space and I've no doubt there was lots of complementary skills around communication, empathy, understanding, really, you know, sort of coaching, developing people. Do, do you look back at that period and go, geez, I, I wish I had uh, made that decision earlier or do you feel that, you know, geez, the, the skills were complementary and you were very lucky to maybe you know be in a position then to change over or, or was there anything maybe back when you were in school or college that you feel if you'd known then it would, it would have been very useful to know yeah I suppose you talked there you touched on the transferable skills mm -hmm. and you're right like communication is is a key one as as, as a teacher it's probably uh, the backbone of, of what we do you know project management stakeholder management time management and um, creativity I'm a very creative person I think that's what led me to teaching as well and uh, because I saw it as maybe the only career where I could be creative but actually now I work in marketing and what better career if you are a creative person to work in than marketing um, and yeah. so I really feel that um, the I would not have changed my degree I'm very happy that I did um, my degree in education and um, like I said my core passion is helping people reach their potential 
Um, but I suppose I didn't know, like I said, there was other ways to do that, other careers uh, where I could actually help people reach their potential, other careers where I could be creative. And I really feel that all those twists and turns in my careers, uh, in my career, um, has really led me to a job that I'm truly passionate about um, yeah. and that I'm truly fulfilled by. So I'm very lucky in that sense. And if, if you were sort of, uh, and I'm, it's a fairly common piece where someone might finish m maybe secondary education or towards the end and they're unsure about what route to go down, was there any sort of guiding light that you found useful or is there anything that you found in particular because you, you, you've experience of working with so many graduates on a day-to-day -day basis and any sort of tips and tricks on that front about how, how to choose the right course? Yeah, I suppose I'm very conscious that at this time of year, um, students have just finished their exams um, and the junior cert and leaving cert are literally just happening. So people yeah. are really focused on their future career and, you know, what path they want to take and make sure all that hard work that they're putting into study actually counts in terms of building a future career. So what I would say to students um, is, you know, don't be blinkered by certain, um, you know, tight job titles or sector titles, etc. Really try to understand yourself and what motivates you and what you are good at and what your strengths are. So like I said, for me, my strengths were always in people, helping them reach their potential, was in creativity. I found out about myself, you know, over the years that I am quite strategic um, in how I approach things. I'm very results orientated. So I think, you know, when you're maybe in secondary school or even in third level, working with your careers advisors is really important because they can actually help you do some psychometrics that will help you actually yeah. put, you know, the language around how what you feel you're good at. And yeah. over the years, I've done a number of psychometrics that have helped me to put the vocabulary and articulate better, you know, the strengths that I have. So I would definitely advise students. There's so much resources out there for them, either at second or third level. Uh, careers advisors are just one of those sources. So definitely tap into that resource and get to know yourself better. So don't be looking at, oh, I want engineering or I want business. Actually, look at yourself and what are you yeah. really good at? And then where does that lead you in terms of a course? And the last point I'd have on that is, you know, um, like I said, I'm very glad that my primary degree was in um, education and then my postgrad in business. But I'm very glad that it was that foundation because mm. I always I might not be a teacher anymore, but I think like a teacher. It taught me really, really good skills in terms of, like you said, empathy. And, you know, one of the big trends around leadership at the moment is empathetic leadership. Um, and I really feel like my degree gave me that base. So just because you've studied something that you're passionate about, which I was um, in college, does not mean you have to be put into a box when you then go to build your career. So just think quite broadly. Uh, your degree just opens up doors so you can build a successful career, but it doesn't put you in any kind of a box. So don't yeah. think it does. Yeah, no, very good. And and I, I mentioned to you, so the Grad Ireland at, at the um, time of our discussion, the Grad Ireland Summer Fair was on yesterday at the RTS and uh, I was invited to do a piece around sort of um, uh, interview success, basically, or, you know, successful interviews. I, I did a previous one, which was called Surviving Interviews. So I prefer this one actually was called Interviewing with Confidence, which I thought had a, had a nicer, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, it, it certainly sounded a lot better. And naturally enough, when the questions came, it was about answering the questions about weaknesses. And I, I sort of put it back as I look to self self awareness is really useful because um I think investing time whether you call it a psychometric assessment or personality test that, that you've got natural areas that are strengths basically right so if someone is naturally sort of assertive basically that that could be a skill in, in some roles whereas in other positions it's more of an accepting type environment whereby you're maybe following a process basically being able to listen and understand that piece uh, the same with sort of social and analytical so maybe using your you know natural and authentic um, approach basically basically, and, and using it constructively rather than calling it a weakness and saying, well, this is my natural style base. It's definitely something I need to be aware of for parts of the position um, r rather than thinking, well, how, how can I get away with, uh, you know, saying something that's going to that's not even gonna, not even gonna be a weakness just to try and, you know, get get past. So I think, you know, what you're mentioning, the self-awareness thing from an early stage is, 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 is a really useful area to explore. Um, t tell me just in relation to that decision about maybe going down a sort of a graduate program or or, or not, maybe because it is a commitment. Basically, how, how long typically is 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 your program, Sinead, that you 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 guys run? Yeah, so our program is a three-year program and it's rotational. So typically, um, graduates would spend twelve months in one international market and then rotate for twenty-four months to another, or vice versa. 
Um, oh. So it is an international graduate program for those looking to build a career in marketing on a global stage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And in terms of the pros and cons, and obviously, and I think that the programs are fabulous, and I would strongly recommend. And you know, we discussed it yesterday. In terms of people who are sort of undecided about making that commitment, do you, do you think maybe it's 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 best maybe to take up some experience on a shorter term basis first of all, or who who would you say is a definite yes in terms of making that sort of three year commitment, or any any sort of thoughts about who, who you feel it's best suited to? Yeah, so I mean, you know, we were chatting about the challenging times that we've all been through, you know, over the last um, uh, two years. And what we're finding um, as we're going out to recruit the next generation of graduate for our business in Irish distillers, we're finding that um, application numbers are down. And when we uh, across the board, so not just for us, but, you know, for every employer, when we speak to um, um, other employers, it's the same trend. And the reason for that seems to be that, you know, we've lived with restrictions now for almost two years and students don't want to be restricted. OK, mm. so some of them are actually um, a little bit resilient or, or resistant, should I say, to graduate programmes because mm. they see it as restricting, like you said, for 12, 24, 18 or 36 months. You know, they don't want to be restricted uh, in that way. They want to be free. Um, so I suppose what graduates need to do is do a little bit of soul searching um, and actually think, OK, well, what is the best thing for me right now? If I don't want to be restricted um, into you know, a graduate programme, which has you know, a certain uh, contractual obligation, etc., then maybe it's not for me. And maybe I do want to take up a shorter term contract you know, to build up some skills, see what sector I want to work in, because that's really important. You know, as I yeah. said, we work in FMCG, fast moving consumer goods, and it's a fast paced industry. You know, so some people it doesn't suit them. Other people then they want to work in tech or pharma or banking, whatever it is. For me, when I worked in banking, I found that it didn't it wasn't the best sector for me, but I loved telco and yeah. I love FMCG because I actually do like working at a fast pace. So, you know, I think the first thing is look and see what is right for you. No, no harm in taking a short term contract. It's an employee's market at the moment. Mm. So we, we are very lucky that at the moment we work in a very buoyant jobs market. So for those looking for a job, I think they need to remember that, you know, employers need them more than they need employers at the moment. Yeah, so yeah. what is right for you is what you should do. And um, I think the advantage, though, if we look at the other side of a graduate program is that it, it always has a very robust and solid training and development offering. So for those of you, for those listening and um, uh, for those graduates who want a solid a training and development offering to give them that solid foundation in their career, there is no better place to start than a graduate program. So look, yeah. there's pros and cons, but at the end of the day, we've all been through the mill over the last two years. So really just think what's right for you and don't be pressured into something that isn't right for you. Yeah. Yeah, and I think like the, the, the other advantages I'd say, uh, Sinead, is that the company has a significant interest in your success, you know, and the, the, the process that they run through has been refined, harnessed, you know, re really looked at year on year to make the best possible outcome. And I, I'd see it as a win-win. Uh, we, we run an apprenticeship program, a three-year apprenticeship program to engage people, and this is our first year of doing it. But it's a it's a big commitment from both sides, you know, and I think that once you're, it, it, it can be a fickle um, employment market out there, you know, there can be times where, um you know, if people have to be laid off for whatever reason, basically, if someone's it's a three year commitment on both sides, I think there's a strong sort of partnership uh, piece there. Um, t tell me maybe just in the broader sort of talent spectrum. I mean, it, it, over the last sort of, I remember the first uh, time I saw the, the PwC CEO's review or annual survey, um, and it used to be things around sort of costs, you know, and setting up new locations. But t talent has been number one uh, for the last 10 years and, and probably never more than today, as you touched upon. You know, there's a major... So it's very competitive out there at the moment to get the best possible people. Uh, there's lots of new skills out there, you know, the areas of technology, even in finance and so forth. You know, there's lots of different uh, new areas, you know, around sort of business intelligence and so forth that just, you know, really didn't exist in, in, in sort of previous years. Um, what, what, what's your take maybe in terms of how, how your program fits in and the broader talent, uh, you know, in terms of the talent growth plans within, whether, whether it's the uh, Jameson or the Irish distillers, maybe just interested to hear as to what, what the strategy is on that front. 
Yeah, so our program has been around quite a while and um, it's been, it was established in 1991, <clears throat> so it's over 30 years old now. Um, and a key strength of the program is uh, the pipeline of talent that it gives to the business. So when I think of, you know, um, people within our business who've come from the graduate program, um, you know, our business acceleration director, Simon Fay, started off in 1998 in South Africa. Uh, one of his colleagues that year was Claire Tolan, who's managing director of our commercial Ireland business here. Um, and I guess over the years, we've had what, about 430 alumni um, go through the program. And about 21% of those still work either domestically with Irish distillers or more globally with Perna Ricar. And um, so, yeah, for us, it's been a key and core pipeline of talent for our marketing function, um, you know, uh, over the years. And so much so that we've now expanded uh, into offerings uh, for graduate programmes in our um, supply chain area of the business, uh, IT. Um, and, and then also into our production side of the business in terms of engineering. So, you know, we've really seen the success of what it do, has done for us on a marketing side over the last 30 years. Yeah. And now the business is actually replicating that and other functions of the business to give that same pipeline of talent. Because like you said, the war for talent is absolutely back. And yeah. Where do you begin? You begin by attracting young talent into the business who then become those future leaders. Yeah, exactly. And it's like you say, supply chain. It's a supply chain of talent, really. Um, I mean, it, it's an interesting space because we, I mean, we we would recruit uh, for some of our smaller clients. We recruit at graduate level, but if we we would meet a lot of uh, could be a financial services company, could be insurance company, could be you know tech or pharma uh, who are set up in Ireland. And I I really encourage them. I try to bring them along to Grad Ireland events because I think it's great having that foundation. And I think once you've got really good standards around the people you're bringing in, uh, obviously you know being able to attract, develop, retain good people is important. Um, you know, right, right across the different levels. But I think once you've got that foundation in place, I think there's a huge value to it. And uh, it creates actually lots of leadership opportunities in the business because it's of the utmost importance of these people are coming in and, and sort of taking on more responsibility. Um, tell me, we, we touched upon the graduate market there. Um, and look, it, ha it has been a challenge. My, my nephew has just finished um, his primary engineering degree uh, in UCD. And I think he had the first six months, he had a great time. And, you know, I, 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 he, I, I'd be sort of uh, coming home sometimes and he'd be, he'd be going out, you know, from a social perspective. And then obviously, you know, COVID came in when he was midpoint to first year. And I have to say it was challenging. You know, he missed out in prob probably two years of college. Now I think he's going to go back and do a postgrad or a master's. So I'm sure he'll make up for it. But what, what's been your experience maybe over the last two or three years Sinead it's someone who's at that sort of cold face of interacting with graduates you know and, and, and seeing people who are sort of are speaking to people who are in the final stage of their college uh, college years. Um, so I suppose what I've noticed is that um, you know that there's there's probably, you know, I guess if millennials and centennials in general are, are tired of having to be resilient, basically. OK, because <laughs> we talk a lot about, you know, this new generation of graduate needing to be very resilient, needing a lot of grit and um, etc. But actually, they're, they're just exhausted with that. So what they want is a company that act, can actually support them. And I think that's where when we're talking about the graduate space and formal graduate program offerings, that's what is attractive, you know, to, to, to some um, students and graduates that are uh, finishing their, their primary qualification. And um, so, yeah, they want a company that, that support them, basically, that will give them that guidance, that will help them build the, 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 the skills, give them the knowledge, give them the tools they need to have a very successful longer term career. And actually, when a company does that to them, they're quite committed to that company because I know what millennials um, you know, it was that they had a bad rep in terms of not being brand loyal or company loyal, that they were quite fickle and moving from employer to employer. But actually, Centennials and Gen Z, the, the new generation that are entering the, the workplace, and they'll make up 27 percent of the workforce by 2025. Yeah. So, you know, what they actually really want is that support. And if they get that support, they will actually remain loyal to a brand um, and to um, to a company. So I'm feeling that's what they want. Also, like there's been a real dent to their confidence over the last uh, couple of years. You know, basically they've been doing everything from, you know, the confines of four walls, the confines of their bedroom, finishing degrees, you know, uh, uh, doing interviews for jobs, etc. So they want companies that actually do give them that physical connection again. Like I'm really seeing a deep desire from the graduates that we hired last year and the ones that we're hiring this year like one of the key questions is like will induction be in person you know because they're just so exhausted and jaded as we all yeah. are 
from online. They really desire that human connection. But I suppose as 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 employers, let, let's not confuse that with them want to be in the office nine to five every day. They absolutely yeah. don't. They want flexibility. They absolutely um, engage with the hybrid working model. They don't want to be nine to five stuck to a desk um, in the office five days a week. Um, I don't think any of us will uh, uh, want to go back to that kind of a model, but they definitely want flexibility. And what they want is clarity on that flexibility. So, you know, when we're going out as recruiters and we're actually talking to students, you know, one of the questions they're asking us is like, you know, what is your working model like now? Is it hybrid? Is it fully remote? Is it fully office based? And what they want is absolutely that flexibility. So they want us to give them the support. Uh, they want us to give them the training, the tools uh, to be successful, be that, you know, um, technical <laughs> tools, training tools, whatever it is. But they actually then want the freedom to go and do the work in a flexible way that actually suits their lifestyle. And um, so that's what I, I, I'm seeing with with um, students. It's a really, really interesting time in the evolution of not just the workplace and physically where we work, but the workforce and what the workforce are expecting from employers now. Yeah, very good. And it, it's because I speak to lots of international companies and I think the reputation of and there's a sweeping generalisation now, but the reputation of Irish graduates uh, seems to be very strong, you know, and it, it's one of the core reasons why companies are attracted uh, to set up in Ireland. Um, and I, I think you've hit the nail on the head. I mean, it, it's incumbent on the, I'm, I'm a, uh, you know, run a business of 12 people. We, we've probably 50, 60 percent graduate over, over recent years. If there was a massive us in them and I had this view basically of this is the way we do things and it totally wasn't aligned basically to the modern day graduate base as a business, you know, we would struggle. So I think it, it's really working together basically to, to sort of appreciate, um, you know, the, the, the I guess what the priorities of the business is. Um, I mean, it, when I was growing up, there was that song people talk about my generation and I think that this is going to be continuous you know in 20 years from now there'll be another generation and people have this view basically but I think it's up to uh, you know to, to be a really strong employer basically it's that empathy piece and being able to understand I think it's still having high standards and priorities basically and making sure the outputs um, are delivered upon but sort of getting with the program in relation to being able to attract and develop the best people you know I think that, that, that that's sort of key um, Tell me a bit about maybe, you know, in a competitive marketplace, and I've no doubt that you have, you know, great demand for your program. What, what's your view in relation to what maybe a graduate can do um, to sort of go above and beyond, give themselves the best chance of success, whether it's your own program, Sinead, or, you know, to achieve their their objectives um, in terms of from a career perspective as they start to maybe express an interest in in pursuing the programs? Yeah, I think, um, you know, uh, I was actually uh, we were doing some training with um, Deirdre McGinn recently from um, Step Up, Step In around um, um, effectiveness online, because what we're finding is, you know, graduates are graduates, so they're new to the workforce in most cases. OK, so what they're trying to do is build up the skills they need to have a successful long term career and hopefully become leaders in their organization in the future. And um, the training we were doing with Deirdre, um, she mentioned um, about building your network before you need it. And I thought it was a really, really good point um, yeah. for um, any of us at any stage in our career, but definitely for people joining the workforce for the first time. So building your network before you need it. And I think, you know, the word networking um, has always been one that people kind of, you know, have a love-hate relationship with. You know, do I love networking? Do I not love networking? But the reality is in the business world, in the corporate world, networking is just building relationships. Mm. And it's really, really important that, um, you know, from very young in your career, you understand that. Um, so it's very important to build that network um, even before sometimes you join an organization to know if it's an organization that has the same values and has a culture that you want to join. So I think um, how they, how um, you know graduates can do that today, um, I think as part of most of their courses, they're actually encouraged to join LinkedIn and yeah. personal brand is a big thing that we talk about. So we obviously work in marketing um, as a brand, Jemison, um, and we talk a lot about personal branding when it comes to our graduates and a lot of our training is actually around um, in addition to the strategy for Jemison, it's actually, well, what's your strategy for yourself? You know, what is your personal brand? Do you understand it? Do you know what it represents? How do you show up? Um, and I think one of the big things that we um, are looking at is with students um, and graduates last year and then 
we've actually adapted our training this year to include it, is finding their voice. So when you build that network, be confident about it. You know, online is a great way through LinkedIn. You don't have to sometimes even talk to the person that you're networking with, but you can build a connection with them. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's really, really good. So when um, students attend a talk, like yesterday when you were at the summer fair and you did your talk about interviews, um, you know, I hope that you got a lot of invites uh, mm. to connect from yeah. some people who attended through LinkedIn, yeah. because that's a very natural way. And Colleges are absolutely excellent in bringing in employers to talk to students. And I really like it then if I am that employer and I talk to students and I get those invites on LinkedIn afterwards um, because it shows them that me that they are proactive in trying to build a network for themselves. Yeah. Um, I suppose then once they actually come into the business, it's finding their voice and finding your, their voice has always been a hot topic when it comes to graduates, finding your voice in a meeting room. But actually, it's now finding your voice online. And we would think as employers that, you know, uh, Gen Z, Centennials, they're digital natives, they're very tech savvy. So sure, they'll have no problem finding their voice online and being confident in an online environment because yeah. that's just where they thrive and live anyway. It's their reality. But actually, it's a skill that we feel that we need to level up in terms of our induction of graduates this year and that we actually had to then add on to our um, training last year because uh, we just presumed that they'd be good online because sure they were yeah. doing their degree online, yeah. doing their interviews online and they impressed us enough to get the job online. But actually then when it came into a work environment, they really found it a challenge to find that voice. Yeah. And I suppose, you know, how they show up online, how they use their voice, the tonality of their voice um, and how that kind of shows confidence and competence in online interviews has become a really big thing. So I suppose, look, when you're um, young in your career, it's building your network and then it's also finding your voice in an online and an offline space. I think they're the two biggest uh, pieces of advice I'd give at the moment. Yeah, very good. I, I really like that piece around building your network before you need it, because it, it's I mean, it, and this is very traditional, but but generally when someone's if, if there's a business and someone leaves a role, the first thing they look around and say, look, who, does anyone know anyone? You know, and if someone's proactive and they're out there on LinkedIn, you know, you, you're you're sort of in the shop window per se. You may not be the, the, the individual may not be actively looking for a position, but but very nice to be uh, to be in consideration, you know, on, on, on that side. Um, and ju I mean, in relation to the final when it comes to the sort of decision making process from your side, if there was one area, so I, I understand that, you know, building up that sort of personal branding piece is key. I would imagine the interviews itself, the communication skills. I mean, but beyond that, you know, re really sort of delving into the the final decision making, if, if you're deciding and if maybe someone makes it and someone who maybe is just short, basically, is there any, any sort of typical themes in terms of people giving themselves the best chance of success just maybe in advance of, of sort of commencing interviews uh, Sinead what, what would sort of jump out? Yeah so um, I'm a great believer in hiring for attitude um, and I suppose at grad level I mean that's the main thing that you need. <clears throat> yeah. The grads are not going to come to you as experts in their field you know they, that expertise is built up through years of experience. What they come to you with is attitude mm. and you can work with attitude. Um, so I think, you know, what we look for in Irish distillers is a can do attitude. We call it serious character. Um, and that's about being a creative, innovative self starter. So we're really looking for graduates with an entrepreneurial mindset. And I mean, that's what a lot of employers are looking for at the moment. You know, uh, they're looking for graduates who can think outside the box, who are very solution orientated, who can come uh, with a problem, but also the solution to the problem, uh, you know, and um, I would say to, to, to students, show employers that you have that can-do attitude, that you actually have the capability of problem solving, et cetera, um, and have confidence in that. I think a lot of the things um, that COVID has done for students, unfortunately, has maybe knocked their confidence. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, you know, if anyone is anxious listening to this or, you know, frustrated or worried, you know, you're not alone, if it's the first yeah. message. But the second thing is, you know, there are a lot of jobs out there at the moment. It is, like we said, an employee's market. Employers do need you. So really just, you know, show them what strengths you have. We talked at the very beginning of our chat about our strengths. All of us have super strengths. All mm. of us have things that we're really good at and we love doing. So identify those and then bring that to the fore um, in terms of how you show up at interviews. And at the end of the day, that's all about attitude. Um, yeah. Yeah, very good. And we, we spoke a little bit earlier about the sort of the the war for talent and uh, Gen Z seem to have uh, 
you know lots of options, which is a great situation. And I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure it's not doesn't fall on, on an individual's lap. Basically, if they, they have to work very hard to to land a desirable position, um, what what's what's the big sort of focus for employers at the moment? Do you think in terms of being able to attract the best people? I, I know we'd spoken about a few different uh, areas, basically about me, Meta and uh, what the future looks like. But what what what? How do you see things evolving over the next two or three years? Yeah, so I think, look, as we said earlier, it's a really exciting time um, for the world of work, um, you know, with the shift in terms of our work, where we work, and then also the generational shift. I think most of us in most organisations work with about four generations now, uh, with centennials, like we said, um, uh, the, the newest um, recruits to the workplace. And I suppose, you know, the research on centennials is quite interesting because I, I, I was always uh, interested in the future of work. So I was, I was talking about centennials when people were still trying to get their head around millennials. And and it was, it's now so interesting um, seeing the research come to life. So mm -hmm. what we thought centennials would want, now seeing it actually come to life when they come into the workplace. So like what they wanted was, you know, higher um, um, remuneration, more flexibility in terms of where they worked, um, better work-life balance, increased learning and development opportunities, better mental health and wellness support, uh, which has been a really big one that I've seen a lot of companies level up um, post-COVID, which has been uh, brilliant. And of course, it's no surprise, a greater commitment uh, from businesses to make a, a positive uh, societal impact. So, you know, that's what they wanted. That's what the mm. research and the theory was saying. And they really want flexible and meaningful work. And, and, and that's exactly what we all want now, not yeah. just centennials anymore. And that's what happens in the workplace, isn't it? Because we work across a multi-generational workforce and um, new generations, you know, have new expectations. But actually that bleeds into or feeds into the expectations of the, the full workforce. So yeah. I think, look, um, employers that are attracting graduates at the minute are listening to what they want, are understanding that it's a new generation and that that new generation have new expectations. And not even that it's a new generation, but they've been through, you know, 24 very difficult months. So yeah. obviously that's going to have an impact on what they want. And I think one of the most positive things um, is this space about around wellness, you know, um, and employers are really listening to that. I know in Irish Distillers, we have a program called Thrive, which is our wellbeing platform. Um, and we had that pre-COVID, but I mean, the amount um, of resources we have now that have been added on post-COVID is really inspiring, I have to say. And we're not the only employer, but um, it's really listening to understanding that this new generation, they are coming to the workplace with increased anxiety. So research does say that, you know, centennials have more stress and anxiety than their millennial um, counterparts. So it's employers understanding that and then mm. putting the processes in place for that. And um, one other thing actually that I found quite interesting is, you know, in the grad space, whenever we talk about salary, we always say on our job specs or on our websites, you know, a competitive <laughs> and we never actually say what the yeah. salary is. Well, we all work in um, an economic environment now, which has seen high inflation. You know, even when we go to the petrol pumps, the cost of, you know, filling up yeah. um, our, 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 our tanks with petrol, etc. So we're all uber conscious about the cost of living. Yeah. And students and graduates are no different. Mm. So one thing that they really demand is clarity on remuneration. And yeah. the, the recent Grad Ireland survey, um, I think it's it stated that the average salary across all sectors now, because each sector will differ, differ a bit, is 31,700, you know? Okay. Um, yeah. So why is empo employers, can't we just be clear about salary yeah. and actually state it uh, for, for students? Because, you know, with the increased uh, price of rent, et cetera, like all these are real concerns that are adding stress and anxiety to graduates. Let's take a little bit of that away by giving them clarity on salary because they are demanding it, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and the other thing, the last thing is really about job fulfillment, uh, because I know you're in the recruitment business like uh, like I am, Paul. And, you know, when we're writing job specs and um, it traditionally was about, well, what's the job and what are the projects that you're doing? But actually what Centennials want is what's the purpose? What's yeah. the meaning behind it? How does this job actually contribute in a, in a real way to yeah. the bottom line and to the ambitions that the brand has or that the business has? And that's a whole new element to even writing job specs. You know, yeah. it's yeah. not about just, well, what's the job? What's the projects? What's the qualifications that we need, et cetera? But what's the actual purpose? Yeah. Um, so look, it's a really, really exciting time in the world of work. I could talk about it for ages. <laughs> yeah, no, very good. And and, and your, your sort of passion, interest in the area is, is, is really shining through. Tell me just uh, when I finished the session yesterday, there was a there was um and, and thank you, there was a queue of people uh, waiting to chat to me, which I hope was a good sign. It, maybe there's lots of stuff I didn't cover off, but there was definitely questions about is it appropriate to ask, and I, so I how I addressed it, and I said, look, if 
for the exactly the reasons you mentioned there, and people are very often moving to live in Dublin. It's you know it is expensive, um, so I, I think as part of the questions, I suggest look, it's probably not the first question to ask. I would try and get a good sense of you know what are they hoping this person might achieve in the first six months, and it's really the, the questions are designed so you can make a better decision if the road is for you, and then you know at some point to say look if it's appropriate to ask, I would be keen to get an understanding of what the salary and benefits are, and if you wanted, you could say look it's not this isn't going to um, this isn't going to be decisive in terms of which role I choose. But it would be useful for me to know. You, would you feel that's appropriate, Sinead, or any sort of tips and tricks along the way about how to bring up um, in, in a conversation? Yeah, no, I think, look, in the grad space, there's always a standard. If it's a graduate program, there's always a standard graduate salary, isn't there? Is there? Okay. Uh, for the graduate okay. program. So it's yeah. a very, if it isn't clearly called out on a job yeah. spec or on, on a recruitment website, it's a very fair question to ask. But I, I, I suppose what I'd be um, advising is always ask it uh, when you're being invited to an interview. So yeah, you're, you're going into the interview actually knowing that and you're not yeah. been interviewed not knowing what the sal starting salary is so when you get invited for interview yeah. when you've been successful in your application process you know at that time when you're invited to interview that's when I'd be suggesting that they ask about and um, the salary and remuneration package especially if it is an actual graduate program because yeah. it's, it's a standardized um, yeah, salary yeah. if it's not a graduate program I would still do the same I mean yeah. I don't want to go into an interview if I don't know what the remuneration for the role is going to be yeah, yeah, I I think so too, and and I you know I I maybe would be more clouded on this a few years back, but I think for the reason you mentioned, in this day and age, I think it's important. Um, we we have some clients who really ask us not not to because they may have a, a discrete piece from a team perspective, but the the application numbers are about eighty percent higher when you list salary. Um, sometimes with a range, as you know, if you put down twenty five to thirty thousand, everyone wants thirty thousand. So you're trying to sort of, you know, by by having a range, you're saying okay, well it could be one or two years experience or or whatever. The level is and and but the signs for twenty five to thirty thousand would be slightly under where where the uh the the, the average salary is at the moment. Um, this we 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 could chat for ages. I I did say to we try and keep so Aiden and our uh, who's our marketing executive. Uh, the first and last thing he says to me goes thirty minutes is perfect. And we've probably gone slight slightly over that. Um, so j just for our audience, Sinead, where 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 can they find you? Where where's the best place to to find you and maybe a little bit more about the program? Yeah, so I'm on LinkedIn. I think it's probably my favorite yeah. favorite social platform. So right. uh, people are welcome to connect with me at um, Sinead Darcy. And um, then in terms of the Jemison International Graduate Program, and um, if graduates listening are interested in uh, kickstarting a career with Jemison, so a career in marketing on a global stage, it's jemisongraduateprogram.com. Yeah, brilliant stuff. Okay, well, listen, you, you've been fantastic your time. Sinead, much appreciated.